So welcome back. We are now ready to start our second part of today's event, the panel of distinguished speakers. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor James Davis over there who is going to moderate the panel. <coughs> Professor Davis has been with the Elmer Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering for a little over two years now. He's one of our young stars and we're very happy to have him uh, moderate this panel. Jamie. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to the panel. I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion today. So joining me uh, is Dr. Dongyan Shu. He is the Samuel Conte Professor of Computer Science. He also has a courtesy appointment in electrical and computer engineering and is uh, one of the directors of the Purdue Sirius Center for Cybersecurity. Uh, his current research interests include computer system security and cyber physical security, especially in the domains of autonomous vehicles, manufacturing, and supply chain networks. And Dr. Shu has received multiple awards from major cybersecurity conferences for his research papers on kernel malware defenses, memory forensics, advanced persistent threat or APT analytics, and IoT vulnerability discovery. Next on the panel, uh, you've all enjoyed hearing from Dr. Nancy Levison, and I won't belabor her biography further. <laughs> um, after her is Dr. Ryan Newton. Ryan is an associate professor of electrical and computer engineering, as well as of computer science here at Purdue. He's worked in the space of developer or software developer tools since 2002 in both academic and industry roles. Uh, in industry, he's worked in engineering and research at Intel, Microsoft, and Meta, formerly known as Facebook. And he's also co-founded a startup and served as a CEO there. Ryan has been a faculty member down the road at Indiana University and is now on the faculty of Purdue University. Welcome. <laughs> uh, Ryan's work centers around increasing developer productivity and software debuggability using deterministic execution and deterministic parallel programming. The last member of our panel is Dr. Eric Matson, who is a professor and university faculty scholar in the Department of Computer and Information Technology here at Purdue. He's the director of the Korean Software Square at Purdue and the co-founder of the M2M Lab, which researches multi-agent systems, cooperative robotics, and wireless communication with a special emphasis on safety and security systems. Professor Matson was previously on the board of the Army Science and Technology for the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. He founded an external limited liability corporation called Autonomous Range, which builds systems and logistical services for government and private organizations. And prior to joining Purdue University, Dr. Matson was in industrial and commercial software development for 15 years as a software engineer, manager, and director at companies such as AT&T and Schneider Electric. So um, let's give a hand to our panelists, please. So the, the title of this panel is, is um, deliberately a little bit provocative. So it's called Conflict and Complementation Between Agile Methods and Systems Analysis When Developing and Maintaining Software Intensive Systems. And so here's, here's the motivation behind this panel. Right? And so you're proposing that we need a paradigm shift in designing safety sensitive systems and security systems and that what we need is more top down analysis. And your approach dates sort of from lessons learned in the 1950s through 70s. It's just not working, and we need to do something new. Now, in software engineering, there was a similar paradigm shift circa the 90s and 2000s that said, we've tried doing top-down engineering design, and it doesn't work. We need to do bottom-up engineering and sort of iteratively evolve our way towards a, a good system, um, whether that system is safe or secure. Uh, I guess I'd, lo I'd love to talk about with the panelists. So that, that's what's motivating this, is sort of these two competing claims to paradigmatic change, one arguing for more top-down and one arguing for way less top-down and a lot more bottom-up work. Um, so that's to set the stage. Uh, so I'd love to start out with a question sort of generally to make sure that we all have a shared definition of what's meant. So we, we know what you mean by top-down systems analysis. I'd love it if, if one of the panelists or maybe two could comment on what they hear when I say agile methods, what the software industry means by that. Uh, maybe, Ryan, you could start. I think you're the freshest from industry. 
Uh, yeah, that's right. And I guess I wanted to bring the perspective that Agile is a bit of a placeholder, and what goes on in software engineering within the software companies, which are not first and foremost uh, safety critical, of course, uh, is, is only sort of superficially called Agile. For the most part, it's a even more chaotic, chaotic and bottom-up process, as it is with open source as well, which makes up a very large percentage of the systems that we rely upon today. Um, so I'm, I'm taking Agile here for the purpose of this discussion as the Agile process itself that everybody knows about with this daily scrum and stand up and a sort of... Why don't you go into a little more detail? Um, some of our participants maybe know what you mean, but in the audience they may not. Sure. So if you find people debating online different software processes and they're talking about Agile, they're most likely talking about not only this system of um, having an iterative improvement upon something that you have ready as soon as possible, rather than a sort of long-term planning process or an older waterfall method or terms you might, terms you might hear. But they, they're also referring to um, a set of practices where you'll get up in the morning and you'll have a daily stand-up where people update their status to the other team members. You'll do two-week sprints where you select a set of tasks that are drawn from a backlog. There's a certain set of rituals. There is a process associated with it. But most software, much of the software development doesn't follow any sort of explicit process at all. And so there's kind of a spectrum of things from top down to bottom up, but there's also kind of this other dimension of process heavy versus no process or low process. And Eric, I, I understand that you were in more of a um, defense contracting, larger system building than, than Ryan was. Can you talk a little bit about whether you experienced agile methodologies there? We actually did both. So I spent lots of years, uh, especially at AT&T at that time, AT&T was a very rich, and, and probably from a safety standpoint, a lot of the model checking and model techniques came out of AT&T at that time, but AT&T was also being broken apart, which now it's kind of more of a cell phone company that it is. At one time, I think 60% of all patents in the U.S. came out of AT&T and Sandia and places like that. Now, what we used it for is, you know, there's, if you look at Agile versus so, like a waterfall, those are kind of two ends of the spectrum, and for a long time, Waterfall was kind of the traditional method everybody used, but it was fairly slow and plotting and you discovered mistakes very deep and it kind of goes back to your expense. It got to be very expensive to change things. The way we used it, uh, uh, and Agile was kind of coming out. At that time, Agile wasn't the term, um, but it was sort of iterative processes. You know, when the OMG um, kind of started defining all these things and a lot of other things for the software engineering world, um, we actually used both. What we found out is in the software method, that the, or the waterfall method, people had a very hard time, especially on the manufacturing floor, getting people to express what they wanted with new systems, especially in unit environments, places that were highly uh, constricted. Um, so we actually used, um, no, we didn't call them scrums at that time because that was a term that came later, but we would go out and actually collect data and, and use very agile methods to generate um, requirements uh, and then plow them back into the larger methods. The good thing about that is the, the waterfall method had a lot of, especially the way we applied it, had a lot of rigor to it and had a lot of uh, structure to it, whereas the Agile, as kind of you said, it's, I know Microsoft used the Agile for years and they had lots of problems with quality and things like that just because the way they applied it. Um, so I, I think it's, I, we applied it by using kind of the best parts of both and in in interlocked in the processes and that actually worked pretty well. Uh, but neither one of them is perfect, and neither one of them will do everything you simply want to do, especially in the context of this. So, so Nancy, um, Eric just talked a little bit about uh, systems with maybe something more safety or security requirements um, and higher stakes in play, and how, uh, in his experience, they sort of used a bit of prototyping to, to explore what the operators experience and to explore what the system's capable of. Can you talk about how that kind of prototyping information can feed back into the, the top-down analysis and the systems engineering perspective you bring? Well, first of all, let me, I, I differ with your first. Uh, Go ahead, differ as much as you like. Your first statement about what, describing what top-down development is. That's not top-down development. And people think they're doing top-down development. They say, oh, well, we do top-down, I mean, we break it into a piece of components and then we work at each of the components and we put them together. That's bottom up. I mean, that first step of breaking into components is easy, <laughs> trivial. That's not top-down. Top-down is real top-down development means you look at the entire system at various levels of abstraction, starting with a very high level of abstraction, but you're looking at the system as a whole. That's the first 
first thing I'd say. Um, the second thing is I think the people are, are making a false, arg a false dichotomy that something has to be, everything has to be agile or it has to be something else. I mean, that's, that's silly. I mean, it's like saying, um, you know, we should um, do everything, build every system exactly the same way. And that's, that's not reasonable. There's different kinds of systems, and we need to tailor our methods. If you have 8,000 engineers and 4,000 of them are software engineers uh, uh, distributed around the whole country, what are you going to have? A, a scrum with 4,000 people on Zoom? I mean, that's insane. It doesn't make any sense. Um, if you're building a system that's going to be thrown away, it's some new app, you're going to get rid of it in three months. You want it out quickly because then you get market share. This is what the Silicon Valley does. And it doesn't have to work so well as long as people start using it. And then you can get them a new version and another one later. Uh, and they'll be happy and they won't go to your competitor. Um, then you use Agile. But you, you, I mean, it's insane to talk about using Agile on some giant complex system that's going to be around for 30 years. It's going to have, have to be continually changed. It's like saying, um, I, I'm not going to look at a map and plan my route. I'll just randomly go around the streets and hope I find the place that I'm going to. If you don't know where you're going, you can't get there. <laughs> and, um, and I believe. And so, sure, there are things and um, you know, this whole agile thing, this change, I was saying at breakfast, we, um, the DOD has swallowed this whole agile business. And they had this one thing where they were, where they were implementing something in Afghanistan. It was a refueling system for scheduling refueling of, air, of planes in the air. And they did it on this whiteboard. They had these little yellow stickies, and they stick it up there. And they did this for a couple of years. And someone said, well, you know, maybe we should automate this. So they automated it, had a small company, Kessel Run in Boston, do it. Took them a very short amount of time. The thing was only going to be used when they were in Afghanistan, so it's deadline. But they knew exactly what the requirements were. They knew the algorithm. They'd been doing it by hand for, um, for, for years. So yeah, it works. So then the DSE, oh, well, then we should do all, all systems that way. I just got a, a call from some, an email from someone, a large defense contractor, I can't mention the name, and they wouldn't even tell me the project, so it's, I'm sure it's secret. And they said, well, they told us we have to use Agile. And they also said we can't write requirements we just need, they'll give us some use cases, and we just should use those use cases. And I said, and, and, but we don't know how to make sure that this thing is going to be safe. I assume this is something that explodes or does something bad. And I said, well, you can't. I mean, I'm not going to be involved. I, I, you can't. Um, that's just stupid. Um, so I, I wish them luck. So I'm not a, a, a fan of Agile unless it happens to be a certain kind of problem. I also, not sure I agree totally with you about people not knowing what they want. People don't know how to tell you what they want. Um, but I've gone in, I made some, grad, some undergraduate <laughs> software engineering students go in and Boeing, they had a program problem and, and they were going to implement it for them. And um, but I taught them interviewing techniques. I taught them how some sophisticated techniques for figuring out, really figuring out what these people wanted to do and needed to do. And they could after, but it takes more work. It takes prototyping sometimes so that they try it. They say, well, no, that's not what I'm doing and want to do. Um, but there are ways of doing these things. I don't think that just doing away with it and saying building anything and then saying, well, do you like it, um, is, the, is a solution to that problem. Go ahead. We, we actually, on that, it wasn't a matter of saying they didn't know. They absolutely do know. They know their jobs well. 
the biggest issue, especially if you like, we were going into a lot of like heavily union shops where getting them to change was damn near impossible. So what we do is you, you had kind of two methods. One, you'd say, okay, you have the fear of the white page. So you give them a white page and say, tell me all the things you'd like to have in your new system. And you'd get back the page and it would be completely empty. Or you'd get a list, it'd be exactly the same functionality they currently have and you're not gonna do anything new. So what we would often do is we'd go in there really quickly for like a week, develop a new system, develop a prototype and say, okay, play with this. This is what you're gonna get. And then that would drive tremendous amount. They go, oh no, this is, this is not gonna work for us. And then they would give you an extremely detailed list of everything wrong with it and things like that. So we would use a lot of those kind of techniques on the shop floor um, to drive requirements and drive specifications because that worked extremely well. Uh, because sometimes dragging it out of them, you know, we'd get pushback from the union boss or the, the stewards and things like that and say, nope, we're not changing it at all. It's like, well, look, we're, I'm just the software engineer. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't make those changes, but the reality is um, we're gonna get a new system and you either get what you want or you're gonna be forced into something. And it, it, sometimes it's not easy. Yeah, they definitely know what they want because they know their job better than anybody. The reality is extracting that from them is sometimes a long and painful process until you put it on them to say, okay, here's what you're gonna get. And then they'll be very uh, willing to give you more feedback. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we just need better tools. We don't have good requirements engineering tools. But better tool, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. Um, we, it's a, an important part of, of engineering. And engineers, especially computer people, want to get to the programming. Where, where's some code I can write? Um, doing a whole bunch of specifications and sitting meetings isn't real fun. So I'd love to ask your perspective on what I think of as kind of pollution from the non-safety critical software world. This world where I've spent most of my time in tech companies where it's almost, I guess to take a kind of devil's advocate position, it's almost giving up on software engineering management instead saying, let's have this frothy soup of all the brightest engineers just trying things and reward people for what they, for what they accomplish. And out of this kind of Darwinian, Darwinian soup, you'll get some good stuff. Gmail was a 20% project or, or what have you. Um, but in this world of software engineering, both inside the major tech companies and inside open source, where it's just passion projects that people are working on uh, in their nights and weekends, we get all this software made. And then now my car is full of all kinds of software, including the Linux kernel, which isn't developed with any sort of rigorous procedure, but it's just the dominant software platform. And, uh, and so as this world of open source software and this kind of mainstream programming culture uh, develops all this uh, library of software, then it makes its way into uh, what I think of as safety critical systems. I don't actually know if this has penetrated as much into our airplanes or our missiles as it has in our cars, but, um, but do, you, do you see it as a problem with sort of insufficiently vetted software sneaking across because it's convenient and it's there? Well, I don't think it's just safety critical systems. I mean, clearly it's the safety critical is, um, it makes it you know, a compelling argument, um, but I don't want to lose money. I don't want to have to, you know, something like 50% of large software projects are never finished, 50%. And of the ones that are finished, something like another half of those never are used by anyone. They were delivered because they, someone had to deliver them and then nobody uses them. There's something wrong with what we're doing here. <laughs> and I don't think it's gonna be solved by Agile. Um, Agile was sort of a, a, at the beginning, was a, a reaction against um, uh, the uh, software um, productivity consortium stuff, the, the maturity capability model, what was it, C MCC or something, whatever, um, because that sort of treated humans as machines. And um, it was not the right way to get good software and get people. But we, the other extreme is, you know, it all is just human creativity is also, I think, uh, a mistake. We've got to get somewhere in the middle. Dungan, did you have something to add? 
Yeah, so I just want to add that uh, regardless of the specific uh, software or system development methodology that you adopt, uh, it is always good to be backed by systematic uh, system analysis in different aspects, the process modeling, system modeling, and you do have to look at the entire system as Dr. Levinson mentioned. You have to look at the system as a whole, and uh, safety security should always be the first class citizen when you start the system design, and you don't want to be in a haste to actually you know, decompose the system into components and say that, oh, you know, you work on this, you work on that, you swim in this swim lane and you swim on that. Because you know, at the end, you know, based on you know, what we see, the vulnerabilities or the weakest link or the Achilles heel usually you know, exists at the border between these system components, right? So I think top-down analysis modeling is valuable in the sense that you try to capture these overarching properties and, prop, uh, and functions and you know, different aspects and try to reflect that and try to keep that in mind throughout your end-to-end -end design implementation process. Um, so you, know, you can do, for example, CI, CD, Scrum, all kinds of agile or pro traditional software development, it, it should always be backed by you know, a sound system analysis model, modeling methods, methodologies. That's what I have to add. Dong Yan, before we tackle that, I'd love it if you could talk a little more about some specific vulnerabilities that you've identified in your research or in reading that really sit at these intersections of components. Um, uh, thank you. So I think that's a, uh, yeah, uh, it's good that you mentioned this. So in fact, uh, when, I, when I was listening to uh, Dr. Levison's presentation about the, the use of constraint to actually constrain the behavior of system, that resonates tremendously with what I'm doing uh, in the context of uh, UAV security. So we, we have a project that aims at uh, looking at the, uh, the controller of the UAV uh, system uh, from both the control and the uh, control both the model and the program perspective. And a lot of the vulnerabilities that we realize are not necessarily you know, the problem or the fault of the system or control engineer. It's actually the process of translating or implementing a very well and scientifically sound control algorithm into the control program. And you tend to see a lot of bugs that you know, are kind of introduced because of a lack of a kind of a secure programming or because of a lack of understanding of both the systems aspect and the software engineering aspect. You know, bugs as simple as a wrong variable name. So you, you, you define a kind of a conceptual, you know, like control variable in the abstract model. And when you write the control program, you know, sometimes you made a mistake, you use a different program name, just program variable. As simple as that. And sometimes, you know, how often you do bound checking, how, how often you do integer overflow check, buffer overflow, and all these, you know, uh, problems are, in, we, have see, we have seen a lot of those in uh, both uh, open source and commodity uh, autonomous vehicle control framework, uh, s software frameworks. So I just want to, I'm sure there are graduate students out here looking for topics and things to work on. And, um, I, I just don't think we need another um, compiler, <laughs> better <No. laughs> compiler. Um, we need, there's really not been enough in systems analysis, yeah. as you said, and um, that includes software systems analysis. Absolutely. And it'd be good if you can expand that to engineered systems that include lots of software. But that's where the real wins are today. That's where the real important stuff is going to come from, um, I think. Did you have something to add? Oh, a chance to defend compilers, perhaps? Go for it. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess I did want to ask the vision of system modeling. So let's maybe narrow the scope to cyber physical systems. And we're not talking about uh, arbitrary software only projects, because I would challenge you to find like a software only project at a major tech company that does any systems analysis or system modeling. Um, I haven't heard of one. I'd like to see an example. But um, in the cyber physical case, when you are performing uh, STPA or other system modeling methodologies, do you envision this as ultimately being um, connected to the code? There is still code, certainly. And it's connected to the code in a formal and unbreakable way where the human doesn't get to mess up the variable name and screw it up at the last mile when model hits reality. Um, I wanted to bring this a bit to the question of formal verification and uh, connecting that formal ver verification back to code in a mechanized way, which is something that our um, programming languages researchers and the people who are building new compilers, uh, Adam Chapala's group at MIT, 
um, are, are very much uh, looking at. Oh. Oh, so, well, I guess a question for both of you, really. Oh, yeah. Uh, would you like to respond? No, go ahead. Um, so I, I think this is a this is a great point. I think in the domain of cyber physical systems, uh, we so I think the software actually plays a special role in a CPS in the sense that the software is almost a digital twin of the physical system. So it's not just yet another component of the entire system. It's actually a reflection of that system, right? In a software, you know, in in a, in, a, in a relatively formal way. So we, at least in my own experience, it is always valuable to actually have almost like side by side, a really, a real abstract system model, for example, like the, like the, six, the six degree of freedom, right, for a UAV, you know, its corresponding controller and the cascading of the primitive controller that controls the position, the velocity, the acceleration, so you have that plot. And on the other side, you actually have your program CFG, like control flow graph and data flow graph, and you actually want to create this one-to-one -one mapping between, you know, the, the abstract controller and the specific program module, the, uh, the abstract control variable names, <clears throat> and the program variable names, and you almost try to create this roadmap, right, that creates this one-to-one -one mapping between these type, like physical components control uh, model and the actual program implementation, and we use that as the roadmap to unite the system engineers and the software engineers, so that every time if they find, you know, they realize that they may have a communication problem, we always go back to that kind of a general, we go to that same page, right, to actually see, oh, you are talking about this control algorithm, and then that corresponds to this software module, or I found this bug in this piece of code, or that actually could create some kind of a physical consequence on, for example, the, uh, uh, you know, hoovering, or taking off, or landing mode of the, of the, of the vehicle operation. So I think that mapping so is very important, uh, which is not typically done in developing a traditional piece of software, like web browsers or web servers. Sure, but just to clarify to make sure we understand the example, like if I come along and do mutation testing and flip the X variable in the model with the Y variable in the actual code, mm -hmm. uh, what catches the error? Um, we, we, if we break the correspondence between the model and the code, uh, which, which part of the tooling is going to then complain and, and, and cry out? So I think you will have, so for, for CPS, you always have to set up a kind of a testing framework that involves not just the program, but also the entire system, right? It could be a real system or it could be a simulator. I think for autonomous vehicles, you typically you involve a kind of a high fidelity simulator. So basically, you monitor not only the program execution, but the entire vehicle operation, and you do a lot of instrumentation and measurements so that you can actually measure the health, the, the health in, in terms of control as well as program execution of the system at any time. So so sometimes if you realize that you know, your, uh, you know, your, your state no longer track that goal, then you realize that you know, maybe your control algorithm is not executing properly, even though the program keeps running, right? So in the traditional program you know, fuzzing thing, you hit a jackpot every time you have a crash. So in our experience, sometimes a control program, it doesn't crash, but it is definitely not right. So I think this is actually kind of new. I mean, at least to me, I feel that this is something that, uh, that, that is quite interesting to me. And actually highlighting the importance of overall system modeling. So Nancy, can you talk a little bit, I mean, you, you had a slide near the end about all the ways you've applied STAMP, and some of them include building tools for, I assume, systems engineers to use. Um, do those tools bridge the gap between the systems engineering model and the software underneath, or are you relying on sort of human operators to do that, that mapping? Yeah, you know, Virtually every accident involving software that I've, I've heard about or been involved in investigating, and there's hundreds of them, every single of them was a software requirements problem, not a software coding error. We, we get coding errors pretty much out. You know, if you can spend some money and time on it, it's worth it. You can, you can do pretty well on that. Um, so what you do is you start with system requirements, and then you generate from that the, the requirements for the different components, the hardware, the software, the humans. Um, and, but you have to start by doing an analysis of the system as a whole and the operation that's required. So I, mean, I agree with everything you're saying. Um, it's just, it's a loss, it's a field that's just been down, gotten enough attention in, in computer science. Uh, I used to be one. Eric, uh, did I see you twitch the microphone earlier? 
Okay. okay. But this, the, the, the one thing to kind of add is one thing is, is I spent a lot of time, we, we, we've done a couple of projects actually here at Purdue with the Air Force Research Labs on microwave vehicles. And in particularly, um, if, you, if you look at, there's very few teams doing microwave vehicles like flapping wing robotics. That's a defense thing until hypersonics came in and kind of took all the money away. So we continued the actual work. And what we did was you have the model, you have the software, you have the actual cyber physical implementation, which is the control vehicle. But what they were interested in and what we actually did for them was, in the middle of it, actually update the model based on, it's, it's not, you know, the, I do a lot of work for the military and the military is very interested in survivable systems. Um, we also do a lot of the manned unmanned, the MUMT, the manned unmanned teaming uh -huh. uh, with these systems. Um, I can't talk about some of it, but we can talk about some of it. Um, but the really interesting thing that, that they want us to do and what we're working on now and we're getting like second level of funding for Air Force Research Labs is not only comparing the, the model and the software, but updating the model in the middle of the actual execution. So for example, if you have a flapping wing robot and the wing gets clipped off, well, that's gonna change your control model. That's gonna change how the bird flies. You know, if you think of it as a bird, which it is. Um, and you actually have to adjust your model to be able to adjust it, which is very complex when in the middle of a flight. But we actually showed that we, you know it's not proven because you can't prove any of those kind of physical things, but you can show that it is valid that you can do it. And so there's a lot of really cool things out there, especially for the grad students if you're looking for really cool projects like this. Yeah, um, it's not so much of a safety concern because the thing is very small and the worst it could do is crash. You, you worry about the safety of the actual. Uh, Remember, I find safety very bright. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The, the safety of the vehicle, uh, you know, it's if you're looking at like a Predator drone, that's a little different story. You know, you're looking at the safety and especially for uh, lethal systems. But I think there's a, a really cool concept there where we kind of even go beyond that. And that's kind of what I was interested in some of the things you were saying is, is how do we actually update the model in the middle of that operation to adjust the model to make the model better. And so we're doing a lot of work with that and, and, and we're applying that to the MUMT system. So MUMT is just a word manned unmanned for the, the U.S. Army. So... So this is a broad question. I'm not sure which of you wants to pick it up, but maybe more than one of you. So when we talk specifically about trying to evolve complex systems that have been built, and often that involves changing the software in some way, one of the goals of Agile methods is to facilitate moving a thing from a working state to another working state. And one of the challenges there is measuring whether it's still working. And so the typical approach has been running tests on it, right? And it'd be nice if we could instead prove somehow based on our models that it's working properly. And, and a, a perennial problem, or at least a perennial claim in the software engineering practitioner community is that you can't scale formal verification of your systems. Um, it, it, there's just too many states and it will take a million years to prove that anything really complicated is, is working. So can it, any of you comment in your own particular sub-areas on how true is that claim? How close are we to letting engineers over a two-week sprint modify an existing complicated code base and be still very confident that you didn't regress behavior in a way that will compromise safety or security? I, I can kind of, uh, this is some of the stuff we're doing. So in, in reference to that, um, yeah, when you have, if you look at the entire system as a whole, it's kind of like, calculating the chess game, you know, a few years ago, you couldn't do it until Deep Blue and some of them came out. The reality is though, is what I know what we've worked on and what I've seen others do is, the model doesn't have to represent every single thing something does, right? Um, you look at the most important aspects of it, the, safe, the, the critical aspects of it from an operational standpoint, and then sort of approximate that versus approximating every single possible thing this cyber physical system could do. And that's oftentimes calculable. I mean, you can actually go out and calculate the states. You can look at those kind of things. Um, and that's worked quite a bit. Now, the biggest issue, and it kind of goes back to what you are saying before, is, is one thing that people do a really poor job of is defining why their systems are so complex. Is it because they have too many, too many linkages to too many things? There's too many couplings. You know, in software engineering, coupling was always the, the dirty word. You wanted your systems decoupled. But that creates a problem in this because if your systems are decoupled, you can't see the giant system as a whole, you know, and each one is kind of its own little individual. So 
I think you can make approximations based upon the most critical fa factors of a system, and that's worked pretty well from a practical standpoint. It doesn't necessarily work from a purely theoretical standpoint. One of the, the another topic I thought of that I think people should be working on is, you may have read it, you should, if you haven't, you should. It's Fred Brooks' uh, paper, No Silver Bullet, and you all read it, hopefully, um, where he says that there are certain, we add a lot of complexity into the systems ourselves, but there is still just some complexity that's part of the problem that we can't get rid of. So I'd like to see people come up with how do we create systems, design systems, without added comple unnecessary complexity. Um, because we do a lot of it. I, I think at Purdue, you guys have this, um, Herb, um, what is it, Goldberg, the, the... Yeah, we have a Goldberg challenge. The yeah, very complicated the way, things. you know, the adding complexity and for complexity's sake. Unfortunately, we sometimes do that too often, <laughs> accidentally. Um, and not on purpose. And um, we, so I think a, a good topic that we've got to get is how do we create systems from the beginning? Instead of leaning on assurance, you cannot assure a, a 10, 100 million line piece of software. 100 million lines in a, soft, in a car today, you cannot assure that. Forget it. If you found a problem, you can't fix it without causing 20 others more serious ones, and you can't be sure that you haven't caused 20 other more serious ones. So we've got to figure out how do we build these things in from the beginning. How do we, what I see people do is they get a set of requirements, and then they immediately create an architecture. And what architecture they use, well, it looks like something they've always done before. Instead of we don't have any theories for how do you design, what kinds of architectural principles should you use to get certain properties out of systems? All systems have multiple properties. What kinds of architectural design techniques can we create to do those? How do we analyze them? How do we look at the trade-offs between this? This may be more reliable, but less efficient. How do we create architectures? How do we start? There's not enough at the beginning of the design process. And unfortunately, in software, and it's just historically, we leaned a lot on testing. I used to be in testing. Um, you can't test stuff. I'm sorry, you have to, but you're not going to get much out of testing. Um, either we start designing systems and becoming more mature, and our ability to create and engineer systems from the beginning, or we're going to still have 60, 70 percent of our, our system, complex systems we build are never used by anyone and can't be used. And that's, that's a shame. That's a tremendous waste of resources. Do you view computation, uh, or in particular computing horsepower provided by machines, as offering any advantage for reasoning about complexity at this kind of system requirements level. So you would think at a glance that um, you, you, the computers can evaluate many more chess states, Dolly can generate uh, artwork synthetically with a text prompt. You know, computers solve these amazing problems that would be beyond uh, human capability. But when it comes to uh, thinking of complex combinations of requirements that are going to yield a failure, like some of your examples, uh, it, it, it seems like we should in some sense, be able to use computers to reason through some of these unforeseen transitive consequences uh, better than humans can, but I'm not hearing that there's any lever for that right now, that I can warm up a computer and have any additional help with this kind of uh, holistic system safety reasoning. I, I, also, I, I, I definitely agree with you, Ryan. I also observed that, uh, you know, uh, the uh, like large-scale software development, uh, especially in terms of the human developer management, I think that is still not very scalable in the sense that you know even for you know like world kind of 
large scale real world production system. Um, so again, I, I talked to some of my colleagues in industry working in the like the names that I don't want to name, but um, they said that despite the complexity of the problem and also the number of software engineers, like hundreds of them, thousands of them involved in the development and maintenance of that software, the core team, the people who actually are you know you know critically responsible for you know CI CD and making those critical commits is a surprisingly small subset. I would yeah. say two digit. Absolutely. So I feel that this is not very scalable, right? Because now we have all these computing power, you know, sitting there, you know, that can be waiting to be leveraged, maybe to uh, speed up or to uh, perform some of the tasks that the human developers are routinely doing these days. To you know, to improve the productivity and the reliability, and facilitate the communication, and you know, smoother CI/CD processes. But in the traditional software development and software bug elimination process, uh, computation is helping with it increasing is, yeah. testing and with increasing formal verification. You already right. mentioned fuzzing, yeah. but also on the formal verification side. So testing and verification are very different things. Correct. And we are getting closer to a world where uh, a human being can write additional logical specifications in their code, right. and a large number of those can be mechanically checked. Yeah. So if you're using something like Liquid Haskell or the Prusty system for Rust, yes. mm -hmm. there's, there's increasingly the ability to ha have, a, in this case, a SMT solver, uh, do a lot of the work for you right. when it comes right. to discharging formal verification obligations. Yeah. Um, but when will that become mainstream in programming? Well, I'm a dreamer, and I can, I can hope it will be uh, the majority of programmers in a couple, two or three decades. But, uh, but now it's certainly not the, the mainstream. Yeah. And even if we had wonderfully verified kernels and compilers and pure software systems, then there's this whole separate question about how it relates to system specifications and cyber physical systems. And that, that Especially part of the specifications themselves are changing. Because you, know, you want new features, you, want new, you, you are defining new performance and functional metrics right, that you need to uh, take into consideration. You yeah, know, that's on tough. the fly. I guess most of our traditional software formal verification requirements weren't really moving targets. So we want to make sure there's not memory errors. We don't have an yeah. out of bounds access. Right. We prove certain properties about a kernel yeah. in terms of safety or isolation, but they don't change yeah. a lot. Right. I think it's also interesting, as as, as Dr. Levinson mentioned, you do need to identify some of these constraints, and sometimes you do need to mine the uh, the existing system. Uh, the, the code, the, the documents, and even the operation log of the system to derive the constraint that needs to be enforced in, in, in the system. So we're approaching the end of this, and we'll head into a Q&A session. I'm sure there's lots of questions out there. Um, but since many of the folks in the audience are students planning to head into industry when they finish, I'd love it if, if each of you um, could share any thoughts you have about <clears throat> As engineers, what ethical responsibility you have as a professional and as a member of a professional discipline um, towards pursuing safety and pursuing security holistically in the systems you're building, regardless of the engineering process, Agile or Waterfall or whatever. Um, how, how should engineers be thinking about their, their duties to society and, and, and as they're doing their work? I have a chapter in my book on ethics. It's the first chapter. And I put it first on purpose because, well, it's the second chapter, but I wanted people not to skip it. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's an introduction before that. Um, every, and I, one of the things I make my students do is look up the code of ethics for their professional society. And there is one for the ACM and for every professional organization, and nobody's ever read them, and, but they should, and I just make them look up so that they can see that there is. And, and there are always, uh, they always contain safety as one of professional responsibility. Um, and, and unfortunately, um, I, I see people not doing that. There was a some people at MIT will never speak, not a lot of people at MIT will never speak to me again, but there was this, this one group who advertised this new class for undergraduates where they were going to have them use machine learning and, and whatever and create tools for medical tools. And they were going to be able, and they advertised that they were going to be used at local hospitals. And I looked, and it didn't look like they had anything about safety in this. So I called them up. I, say, I, I wrote a bail. I said, are you going to teach safety? And they said, no. 
said, don't you think he should? You're going to use this on real people? Yeah. And they said, no. And I said, well, you know, that's really unethical. <laughs> so they said, well, if you want to come and teach them a class, I'm supposed to come and teach their class? And if you want to come, we'll give you a couple hours to teach them about this. Um, and I said, no, it's not my responsibility to teach every, everything. You shouldn't, you know, people don't seem to think about the ethical responsibilities. I think that's what you may be getting at. They're not thinking enough and we're not teaching them enough to explain to them. Um, there's people's lives at stake. This is what you, most of what you're doing. Or their money, which is also you know, their livelihood. Um, all of these things we're, being, we're responsible for and we have to take that seriously. As, as what we're doing with our lives. Well, let's take a minute and thank the panel. Um, <clears throat> and we've got about 15 minutes for questions. So if you have a question for the whole panel to consider or a specific person, um, there's a couple microphones around. Shoot up your hand and we'll get you a mic. Okay, um, thank you, and um, it was a very explosive lecture and um, interactive session. Um, so I have two questions here, one for um, Prof. Le um, Nancy and um, the second one for Prof. Dan um, Yang. Okay, one. Okay, so the question is on constraints. So the whole, um, one, one thing I got from your lecture is like, um, from this interactive session is that the um, whole concept of um, the new paradigm is about enforcing constraints on a, of, on a system. But these constraints first need, need to be identified. Um, so I'm actually now curious. First, to identify these constraints, how do, like, are there newer ways to identify these constraints on a system? And secondly, what happens if we miss a constraint or an important constraint? Um, yeah, thank you. I didn't hear it. So the questions were, um, how do we find the constraints in the first place? Your paradigm requires that we have them. So where do we get them? And are there new tools and techniques that you could talk about? And the second part of the question was, um, what, what are the potential consequences when we miss a constraint, and how do we find it before the plane crashes? Yeah, you know, we can only do, uh, let me do the second one. I mean, the, the, you can only do as much as you can. I mean, the world's not perfect. Engineering is never going to be perfect. I will never, ever claim that my tools find all the unknown unknowns. They find many of the unknown unknowns, but not all of them. I, nobody can guarantee that in any kind of analysis program. Um, and, but we need to at least do the state of the art. We need to at least do as much as we can. That's all we can do. How do we find the hazards? Identifying the hazards are not, is not usually very hard. Um, part of, the only thing that may be tricky is getting the stakeholders to tell you what their priorities are, because it's not our responsibility to decide what's, what's important to them or not. They have to decide what's important to them. Uh, we're just a client of theirs. Um, but that's not usually the problem. Identifying the constraints are pretty simple, actually, it turns out. Um, this is the rest of the stuff. Figuring out whether this, they, they hold is the real problem in your system or how to build a system that always enforces them. So I, I do feel that this is almost like a kind of an iterative process. Sometimes in the first iteration, you may not be able to identify the full set of constraints that you want to enforce for the system, but you can actually do that throughout you know, the, uh, the production or the test operation of the system. And as I also uh, mentioned earlier, you are also able to derive some of these constraints from the system itself. So put it in a, for example, a clean and safe environment, operator system, you know, uh, you know, with guarantee, make sure that you see all the normal operation, and at the same time, collect as much data as possible. So this is where machine learning comes to the rescue. So you can actually mine the data to derive some of the rules, invariants, or constraints that are not even specified in the design document. 
for example, these parameters are supposed to satisfy this mathematical uh, relation. So, and then you can have the human expert verify that and see if the, your program or if your system actually enforces that rule or that constraint. And you can actually do that in an iterative or kind of a spiral process. Uh, hello. Uh, hello, this is a question referring to your previous uh, lecture, Ms. Levison, but uh, for the plane incidents, why didn't they check out, why didn't the software check altitude in order to determine if the plane was landing or not? So the question was, in some of the examples that you shared of the aircraft accidents. Right, how why? do they know that they're landing? Yeah, and so. That they've landed? They use different cues. Uh, one is weight on wheels. How, you know, is there weight on the wheels? You can measure that with sensors in your wheel. Um, they use things like wheel turning rate. So if you're landing and you're, you're going, your wheels should be turning. The wheels are, are, you know, the landing gear is extended before you get down, but it's not gonna rotate unless until you get on the ground and start rotating it. So there's a whole bunch of cues. Was that the question? Yeah, so one, part of the question was why not use something like an altitude sensor? Do those not exist? Are they too expensive? Or is it a bad method in the, the existing world? Oh, why not use an altitude sensor? Um, there must be a good reason. I don't, I don't build a design aircraft. <laughs> um, but there must be a good reason. They may not be uh, accurate enough. Um, they. Um, they did on the um, in Mars Polar Lander. That was the spacecraft that, that crashed into the Mars when we tried to land it. And um, they have, um, they, they did try and use a, an altitude sensor, but they also use, I mean, these things fail, everything fails. So you have multiple things. And they have these very um, sensitive sensors on the landing legs, but it turned out called Hall Effect Sensors. And they're very, very sensitive because as soon as you get down on the surface, there's this thing, uh, a, re a thruster, that's, that's slowing down the aircraft, like a reverse thruster, uh, the spacecraft, um, by pushing up against it, how it slows it down so it doesn't crash into the surface. And um, they actually um, um, used this, uh, it turns out that when they, they have to extend these wheels this, um, before they get down to the ground, and there's some noise that, that gets generated when the wheel legs are extended. And the engineers knew about it. Uh, they didn't tell the software engineers about it. Um, so the software engineers didn't know about it, thought it had landed, and then turned off the reverse thruster, basically the this, this sent engine, and it crashed. Um, but they had, they had also some altitude sensors. The, it, it's just, it's, it, I, I don't really know why. There must be some, do you know any, do you know why they don't use them? My, my, my educated guess is that, uh, you know, because sensor fusion is very typically used. They actually use not one, because you don't want to criti critically depend on, on just one sensor, right? But, you know, because of this quote unquote uh, democracy among these different sensors, IMU, whatever, they need to reach an agreement, right, before raising a real alarm. And sometimes if they cannot, especially because of the malfunctioning of a subset of them, then they cannot agree with each other. And, you know, that's really a kind of a fuzzy, kind of a false positive or false negative moment. And I think this is, my guess is that, you know, this is the reason why inaccurate uh, or, you know, like FP or FN, a false positive or false negative happen. And I think the situation you mentioned, you know, talk, we talked about belongs to that. They have things like ground proximity sensors uh, that they use to make sure you're not going to hit the ground before you. Um, but you remember, ground isn't necessarily all flat. <laughs> you know, you can have a hill and go over there and you think that you're now landed and you're, you're not. You know, now all of a sudden that's not, hill isn't there. Um, there are actually a, actually a fair number of airports that have big mountains right in front of them. They're not real safe to land at. Um, they have a lot of accidents running uh, into them. I think I saw a question over here. Hello. Um, so uh, first, thank you very much for sharing your experiences. 
move it closer to your mouth. Thank you very much for sharing your experiences. I have a question. Uh, if you could share your comments on the V model, the V development model, where you design the requirements and you test. So the question it's is- It's waterfall with a kink in it. Well, it was just, it's waterfall. Yeah. They just, it was hard to draw all those lines going back. So they made a kink in the waterfall so that it was easy to draw the lines without them hitting, crossing each other. That's the artistic. <laughs> anyway, yeah, the V model. So you don't like it. You, can you use the microphone, please? So um, maybe if you could elaborate on your comments on, on it. Uh, so you, I'm guessing maybe you are not a big fan of it. So he's, he's, he's curious if you like the V model or waterfall. Um, or I, you know, I, I don't, what I try and teach my students, the first class in my software and system engineering classes, I say I want them to look at all the different criteria that might affect the processes that they choose to use in system engineering. We have a long list of them. It has to do with the types of systems, what they're going to be used by, who's going to use them and stuff. There is no one model. We want to simplify it down and say there's one thing we should use for everything. Agile works for some things. I'm not even against Agile. It's just you have to match your system engineering process to the problem you're trying to solve. And I don't think we teach people that. We, we, we fall in love with one model. It all has to be waterfall. It all has to be agile. It all has to be, um, uh, you know, there's, there's more than those. Spiral. There's, there's dozens of these. Um, it depends. And I've seen some comparative studies that showed that when they used, uh, they compared a, uh, an iterative, more iterative model with a waterfall model, and they did two different teams, and the more iterative one, the users liked better because it satisfied their needs, but they weren't as, as easy to maintain. They were much less reliable. They were other, you know, there's different properties. You're not going to find, we, we've got to stop being naive and thinking there's one model that's going to be perfect for everything. You, you've got to, it, we've got to teach people on that we don't do, I don't think enough, to match the model with the properties of this problem we're trying to solve. But I, I think, from my experience, you have a couple of things. One is matching the model with what you're, the problem you're trying to solve. The second is people don't, they think the model's gonna solve everything for them. Oh, we just follow these steps and everything will just magically happen. The rigor, the discipline, all of those things that they don't, when they don't employ those, it doesn't matter what model you use, you're gonna end up with a disaster, and that's why the old Software Engineering Institute, you know, most, most software engineering programs, whether they were safe or not, were 250% over budget, they were, never came in on time, and then what happens is, because you're over budget, management comes in and says, okay, kill all the testing, <laughs> you know, kill all the, you know, model checking, kill all those kind of things, and go right to coding software, and it's literally, something out of a Dilbert cartoon, you know? Just start writing code because that's what we want to see. We don't care about all this other stuff, just write code. And I can't tell you, I could sit and tell you stories of how we changed an entire software project because my CEO got invited to the Nagano Olympics. You know, uh, we had to change all the dates just for that. You know, so you have all this arbitrary nonsense that kills the discipline, kills the rigor of the project, and that's the biggest, that was the biggest issue I ever saw was the, the process, the process can be followed, but if you don't do it correctly, you don't care, um, it doesn't matter. The, none of that stuff will solve any of your problems. It'll just make it worse because you spend a lot of time documenting stuff you're not gonna follow. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, Thank you everybody for the insightful discussion. So uh, one question I had for everybody in the panelists. So far, most of the examples you've given are somewhat physical systems like airplanes and torpedoes and so far. Can you give me an example from your career uh, consisting of a more abstract system, like a software-only system? Because I, I believe it would be kind of different. So are you looking for an example of a failure or an example of applying these methods to? A failure, yeah. Okay. Um, given the time constraints, maybe one or two of you could comment on a software only or an IT systems failure that you thought was particularly spectacular and maybe could be traced to not thinking about the whole system. 
Well, you know, first of all, I don't like the word fa software failure. Fail softwares don't fail. Software doesn't fail. Physical systems fail. Software is an abstraction. It's a pure abstraction. It has no physical reality. How does this, an abstraction fail? I mean, it, it doesn't. It doesn't stop working. It doesn't break. It's, um, it's just an abstraction that isn't useful for the problem you want to use it on. Um, so, so that's, you know, I, I got distracted by the words of the word failure because I, you know, it drives me crazy. Also, human failure drives me crazy. I mean, when your heart stops, you fail. Otherwise, the human's trying to do the right thing and in a different situation, it probably would be the right thing and they didn't have the information they needed to know what was the right thing. I don't know, did they fail? They were doing the best they could with, with what they got. So what was the question? So um, <laughs> I'll, I'll repeat the question. Ryan looks ready and then you can come back after he's Oh, done. good. So, yeah, I guess I would say that um, for major websites that everyone uses like Google or Facebook, uh, there have certainly been outages over the years and in my personal experience, they mostly have to do with fairly small traditional software bugs. So things like um, a uh, unsigned integer instead of an integer, uh, it will not go negative, instead it will wrap around. And things like bounds overflows. The kind of little bread and butter errors that are the things we deal with in uh, CS 101 programming assignments are also the things that can cause major problems for major pieces of software at some level. Um, so uh, often it's not necessarily even some incredibly subtle interaction between 57 different components that necessarily brings something down. It can also be the little stuff, which is why maybe one of the, um, one of the rules that we should follow is, is to not mess up the little stuff and to use the best available technology. For example, use Rust, don't use C++, don't have bounds overflows by design, know which, uh, which objects can be shared between threads and which uh, types are signed and unsigned and required extra checks and have, uh, and have that be enforced so you don't mess up the little stuff. So Nancy, maybe to close this out um, and to, to tie this back together, um, for teams that are experiencing, I mean, you know, this is the problem. Is I'm losing my hearing as I'm getting old, and microphones are the worst hmm. because they distort sound. So I'm, I apologize to everyone. I'm trying. So it, Ryan just mentioned that major companies, Google and Microsoft and, and Facebook, have outages that cost them on the order of millions of dollars that can be traced as a sort of a root cause to an integer overflow. Um, how could we use your methods to not have an integer overflow cause millions of dollars of losses at these companies? What would you suggest that they change in terms of constraints they can define or processes they should pick up? Or what do you think? Google's using our stuff, by the way. <laughs> um, they, start, they, love, they love it. Um, if this isn't, this isn't um, a component engineering. I do system engineering. And um, yeah, that, I'm, I'm sure there are problems where we have stack overflow and all these things. We've always had them. Um, we have a lot of tools to get rid of them. Most of the time when we have those, people didn't use the tools right. I mean, I don't think that this is necessary, uh, you know, impossible to deal with nowadays. Um, but it's not the kind of things that are causing ex uh, real problems. I mean, it may cause them a problem because their customers don't like having outages. Um, but it's not causing accidents. Um, the real systems, they spend so much time on them that they don't, it's not the coding errors. That are, that are the problem. Even when there are coding errors, um, they don't seem to be causing the big, big problems. There have been, they looked at all the spacecraft software for years at, at JPL, and they have found there were uh, requirements problems and there were coding problems, but the coding problems just didn't cause the loss of the, of the spacecraft. I think that brings us to a great I, I stopping point. I don't know why. Point. I mean, yeah. there, we probably could so let's, speculate. Um, thank, thank the panel again. Um, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Shu and Dr. Newton and Dr. Matson and especially Dr. Levison for joining us today. Um, I hope you all learned 
a lot about safety engineering and assuring holistic properties and enjoyed this dialogue about software engineering and systems engineering methods and some of the different application domains. So thanks again for coming.